There we go. It should be up and live now. Uh, well, thanks very much for getting in touch, Heather. It's uh, we we can't be any further apart, really. I'm in the UK. You're locked down in uh, in where in Australia? Near Byron Bay. Near Byron Bay. Yeah. So, um, but it's it's lovely to meet you anyway. So, thank you for uh, agreeing to have a chat. Um, and what fascinates me about this whole process, pain is quite a dry subject really but it's, it's it becomes a life when you hear people's success stories you know what they did and I think those stories can be very inspiring to other people who uh, uh, maybe feel stuck maybe don't know where to start or um, I, I just, someone's just looking for inspiration to know it's possible to recover when maybe they thought it's never been possible so I, I, I know nothing about you nothing okay. apart from where you live and uh, so would you happy just to tell me your story? Sure. Where would you like me to start from? <laughs> so, so the big thing that connects us both, I suppose, uh, apart from you, you've been on the lockdown and I was recently finishing one, is uh, pain. Pain. So what what was it maybe that brought you to the to kind of um, this this field of understanding that's maybe different from a lot how a lot of people think. Well, um, I first actually got to know about you through um, the "Tell Me About Your Pain" um, the Facebook group. You oh, yeah. had, were adding a few things to that, and I was uh, struggling through something and ended up copying something you did and shared it with my physio and so that's how I got to know you about you yeah and I'm also part of a few um other Facebook pages like TMS Roundtable so I saw your interview with the two ladies from there um my pain my real pain I guess started we used to live in New York City and moved here about uh, eight years ago and started getting shoulder pain um, it got really severe and I ended up going to uh, some I end up going to an, uh, a few different doctors and had MRIs and CAT scans and everything you know went through trying to figure out you know in, in cortisone injections, um, and then found out that I had frozen shoulder, but I also had a torn rotator cuff and had a calcium spur. So I had um, an arthroscope, which helped release that. And, but because my system, I realize now, because my system was so sensitized, I couldn't tolerate any painkillers. So, I wasn't able to take any of the medication two days after I had the procedure. So I was in a lot of pain. Um, I'd found an amazing physio here who um, kind of helped me through that. About six weeks after the operation, I fell in the main street here in my town and broke the wrist on the same arm that I'd had the arthroscopy done broke my wrist <laughs> so now I've got a cast um, on the bad shoulder and then when I had that taken off it my hand felt really strange and it felt like something else was going on and everyone said no no it's because you know you haven't used your hand and um, once we take the once we take the cast off I think with a bit of you know exercise and physio you'll be fine and then I got diagnosed with, because um, my hand started swelling, I got diagnosed with Crips, complex regional pain syndrome, on the same hand. So I was in a pretty bad state, no painkillers, um, frozen shoulders, um, had the procedure, broke the wrist, and then I've got Crips. So my hand had swollen to more than twice the size of what it was. Um, I ended up going to our local hospital. So I wasn't, I didn't feel like um, 
I didn't have much hope actually, but I went to the local physio hospital and they did some mirror therapy with me, which you're aware of that, mm -hmm. the mirror box. Yeah. So that was the first introduction that I had because um, the uh, physiotherapist said to me, I think um, that you're going to have a lot of success with this, where I, everyone else had said to me, you'll never get the full use of your hand back. So I did the mirror box within three months. My hand was really good um, and I got full use and it's just normal. So anyone with Crips who's been told something else, don't believe them. Um, so that went back to normal. But that's the first thing I thought, wow, the brain is really, I was so astounded that the brain could do that, but the brain could also fix itself with the, with the mirror box or the mirror therapy. And um, the woman there, the physio, suggested that I go into a pain clinic because I was getting a lot of lower back pain. I started getting pain all through my body and went to lots of chiro chiropractors, doctors, osteopaths, went through the gamut and then eventually got diagnosed um, finally with fibromyalgia. Of course, going to all the practitioners, I got probably 12 diagnoses of all different things. So the chiropractor gave me one. The you know, osteopath gave me another one. So by the time I'd gone to the pain clinic, I was in a pretty heightened state. I used to, before that, I used to live in the bath. Like I would have four or five baths a day just to calm everything down, just to relieve the pain. I couldn't tolerate anything more than paracetamol. Um, so I went to the pain clinic and to this physio in a really depressed, um, overwhelmed, isolated state. That's the only way that I can put it. The physio was the first day that I saw the physio. I, it was the first time I really felt like I was heard and acknowledged and I felt safe. The, uh, that's the only way that I can put it. I felt totally safe and held in, with this woman. She didn't actually touch me as a physio. And she said, why don't you come along to my pain clinic, which I did six weeks. So I started learning about pain science and starting and learning how the brain works. And we started doing a little bit of pacing and I did really well. Um, it was a slow, it was a slow progress, but I did, I did quite well. And then <laughs> about six months after that, I fell off my bike onto my other shoulder. So I was starting to ride my bike, starting to walk a little and fell on my other shoulder. So then I got frozen shoulder on that one as well. And um, I decided not to go through with having another arthroscope. I'd kind of learnt a fair bit about um, pain science and what it does and my healing journey had started to work a little bit. So I just worked through it with the help of my physio, um, who's more a mind body person. Um, I got through that. Um, so that's kind of the basic story. That's the first part of the story. So it's fascinating to hear that recovery from what was quite a dark place, you know, and, and it's interesting that you, that the catalyst is someone listening to you, you know, someone listening to your story and um, everybody who comes to see a physio or a chiropractor or a doctor or a nurse, that opposite person is, is wants to tell the person their perspective on the pain, they'll give them their diagnosis, <clears throat> it's a hierarchy really. But if you place yourself uh, or if you sit alongside someone who almost uh, doesn't want to tell you their opinion, they simply want uh, you to feel listened, that, that's, that's a very powerful thing that I've, I've learned myself really, that um, the patient's been given so many answers already that, that uh, to give another, uh, which is another inherently complicated answer, um, it just adds to the confusion a lot of the time. It's another thing that someone has to process who's already in the fight or flight state and has been for whew, years in some cases. So it's really nice that you set the scene and said this just made you feel safe and listened to. And have you looked back and thought, I know that you've had a 
you fell off the bike and you broke your wrist. So there's there's trauma triggers for those obvious injuries, isn't there? Have you looked back at, at the, the pain that came without trauma? And maybe what was happening in your life at the time? Have you identified behaviours or events or moments? Have you, have you, have you, you don't have to look backwards to get better, but some people... No, it's, look... been a, it's been a really interesting journey, Drew, and I never thought this was going to be a journey. I mean, I've always been a person who has... Um, I've been a little alternative and I have taken the road sometimes of... Um, I owned a health food shop. I was in the music industry for a long time. Um, I have always kept myself fairly healthy. So, and I have always been a seeker, I guess that's a seeker of knowledge. So I guess for me, when I went to this physio um, and felt safe and acknowledged and heard, because I felt like that, and encouraged, I felt like there was hope. I was getting a lot of diagnosis that, you know, well, you'll have to do this for probably the rest of your life. I don't know if you'll ever get better. There was a lot of negativity, which was stirring my anxiety up and then stirring the pain up as well. And for the first time, I had someone who made me feel I felt encouraged. I felt like I had hope. And because of that, once I started doing the pain clinic, I could really start to, because I could trust this woman, I started to hear what she had to say. And I said to her when I had the second frozen shoulder, do, do you think um, that I need another arthroscope? And, of course, she's not able to say certain things, but she said to me, shoulders heal. Yeah. And I let it go and shoulders heal. And, um, yeah, so it's been a really interesting journey that I've now taken reading courses, um, started to look right back at my history and realized that there were a lot of things along the way from childhood traumas until the shoulders. And I can see a lot of connection because I grew up in a, you know, child with childhood trauma and then got chronic fatigue. Um, I'm a bit of a poster child for Dr. Sarno's um, personality type. <laughs> um, and I guess that's what you're asking me. Have I looked into any of that stuff? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the no. things that was really amazing was that when I had my frozen shoulders, I have a son who's got an intellectual disability and he was anorexic at the time. And I can remember standing in our sunroom and I did this and I said, honey, I've got you. And I, it was like I had this image of myself holding him. And it was like I couldn't, it was like I took the pain of him on because he couldn't handle it. Yeah. And, or I thought I had to take it on as a mother because he couldn't deal with the burden. Um, so it's been a really exciting journey for me. This healing journey has turned into... I now work on the collective's reference group for Lorimer Mosley as a volunteer. I have completed Howard Schubiner's courses and I work as a pain coach. That's amazing. And I just feel so privileged to be able to do this. Yeah, it, it's amazing that if you, uh, your story alone is inspiring, but then if you, um, if you feel confident to, uh, listen to someone else's and give a perspective on that and not not everyone feels confident enough to do that that's that's again it's part of another journey to feel confident to then help someone else with theirs but it's a lovely it's a lovely um pathway to take isn't it absolutely and i realize how amazing that the brain is and how many things and i was just reading actually 
in your book today. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that I just started it because I it only came in the post just before um, I dialed you. So I was just sitting for a few minutes. How many things are included? How many ailments are? How would you put it? Um, connected to all of this. Yeah, yeah. People, uh, I've chat with other physios, and uh, pe some people say, uh, "So what? How, how? What percentage of people who come to your clinic? It's a standard physio clinic, you know, same all around the world. What percentage of people are presenting with?" these uh pains that are uh, maybe influenced by by what we're talking about and i say anybody and everybody who um has pain for more than about three months everything everything and even those within that three months you can see them if even if it's a twisted ankle even if it's a whiplash even if it's the early signs of a frozen shoulder and you can you can see them um, people who haven't had trauma these are the classics they've had no trauma and yet the pain is huge and the belief systems that uh, justify the presence of that pain for many people are, are the classic uh, stereotypical um, I slept funny uh, it's the mattress, uh, it's bad in the winter, I've got a trapped nerve, uh, I've pulled me back, I've, I've done my shoulder, almost this ambiguous thing that's been happened, that the person can't comprehend the level of pain they've got for something that didn't fit with what they were doing at the time, so they have to attach that to a belief that's just a cultural belief, I've slipped my disc, I've this, I've that, I've the other, and um, in this early three month phase, if you're able to uh, shine a light back on that and, and say, oh, look, it's, you know, the, to have that much pain is, um, is justified if you did have trauma, but you haven't had. So the pain's real. It's, it's just, it hasn't come from the trauma you believe, uh, you, you believe it has. So if you're able to change that belief early on, and a lot of people who work in this field work with people who it's a year, it's two, it's three, it's 10 years, it's 15. I have the, um, for, I'm fortunate, I suppose, I meet people at those early stages that um, I have the opportunity to, to maybe prevent some of the chronicity that I've possibly contributed to in the past. To be able to say things that are a very different, like that lady says, everything heals, and everything does heal within three months. It doesn't mean that someone should and always will be pain free at three months because there's a level of conditioning to return back to that person's life that might mean it's six months or nine months or whatever to get back to that level. Uh, but that conditioning has to be in a way that um, is respectful of the changes that have occurred to the body and in a in a calm and consistent way so that the person processes the experience of pain during that rehab in a way that they think clearly on experiencing that pain they, they breathe calmly they move in a way that's that's not fearful of the pain and the emotional expression of, of that is uh, healthy and it's that think, breathe, move, feel that's almost intuitive when we have a young child, we quickly can turn it, it quickly can turn it around for that child that's in pain. Really quickly, they think they're gonna die, we tell them they're not. They're breathing like it's the last breath, and we slow them down. They move in a way that's so guarded and we flip it to one that's a small boundary and you can do it, it's fine and the output of fear or anxiety that prevents them returning to the place of injury is, is quickly flipped, either gently coax, come on, you can go back, or maybe a little bit more assertive, no, that's enough, come on, back to your friends, back to the bike, you can do it. And as soon as you flip those four things, it's done, the child's pain's gone, independent of whether it's the, the arm's bleeding again, 
sometimes the medical authority needs to be more than what a parent can give, but it doesn't matter because as long as the same information comes from the doctor with a broken arm or whatever the injury is that's appeased or explained, the, the child walks out of a fracture clinic with no pain. But the, the, the difficulty we have as adults is to be the two voices in our head. Yes. If we have a dominant voice and that voice through our life has been you prove how good you are to anybody else by pushing hard which comes from a feeling which comes from a belief which comes from an unconscious set of behaviors we automatically default to when we don't feel good to push really hard to feel better so we put in the when you think of pain pain is the stress response and then you start to use the stress response to overcome the stress response it's a fatal error for some people well not fatal but actually it's fatal for some people because they constantly try and beat the disease they beat i want to beat cancer i want to fight the pain i want to overcome it which is noble when you're going for a certificate in life or to win a race these these mechanisms are perfect but we when we haven't been trained to have two options to recover from pain because we might have seen only one route, only one route that's a stressful route. It's, it's a pleasurable route in the short term. It's encoded as pleasurable. It, it feels good to go and achieve something. It feels good to use the dopamine system to overcome a stressful event, but it's only ever short lived. But if you have to repeat that behavior a lot, that's when we automate it. And, mm. and, and, and when, the, the reason I'm sometimes cautious about asking people if they look back on their life or um, have they considered these other things is that a lot of times people think they, um, they're to blame. You know, they're, they're to blame. And <clears throat> because they'll say, well, actually, can you see what you were doing at that time? And, but it isn't about blame. It's about, well, can you do you accept responsibility? accept responsibility isn't blame at all so i'm responsible for, for everything that's happened in my life and you are for yours uh, and if we're happy with the outcome of the good things then we quite happily keep say yeah we're responsible for that but sometimes we're not very happy about accepting responsibility for some some of the things that maybe were painful or unsuccessful yeah and, um, and i think sometimes as a ch as a child the big thing for me that as a child of three or four, when you go through some kind of trauma, you're not emotionally intelligent enough or have the vocabulary to process that emotion. So I've been able to go back and feel that emotion in my body in a, in a good way with a professional person and help process it. And I had a tendency initially to but my dad was a Second World War veteran. He did the best he could, you know, to justify, to because he's my dad, so I don't want to really betray him. And the trick for me then was, but that's how you felt. That's what happened to you. And to be able to work through that and process it, I, I mean, I've been going for different kinds of therapy for years but that was the thing that I got through really quickly and I got that and I got that some of that does sit in the body because I've gone through many years of so much stuff that was I just told you a little, little tiny yeah. bit no but Not you're absolutely well. right the child just simply wants to survive the moment yes that's all and it was so much trauma that I could not speak up or be angry because I couldn't match that anger with the anger that all was already there. Mm. So I was protecting myself by not verbalizing it and basically pushing that emotion down. And that's why I say, you know, when I, this is a journey. Yeah. It's it, about going to a pain clinic and okay, now we're done because some of the triggers come back up and re-trigger the pain. And it, you, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Sorry, I get really excited. <laughs> it's lovely, yeah. But now, now, you have a, now you have two options. But if you experience pain today, I, I, really, I hope you don't, but you know. <clears throat> I do. Yeah, I still have a lived experience, yes. That means that you have a, you have a choice of, of, of uh, default behaviours of, of when we don't feel very well. 
think, oh, my, my pain's back. I can't believe it. I won't be able to walk. And, uh, um, and, and whatever comes with that, and often that's automated, mostly that's automated, but consciously think it's almost uh, a choosing an alternate. It takes practice, takes coaching. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't take coaching, um, it's an epiphany for someone. If it's an epiphany, the emotional charge flips really quick in the moment. And super, that, they're the book cures. They're the, the, I got it. Am I like, and often I think that's a fear-based, a fear-based uh, connection with pain that's so strong. As soon as the fear goes, the pathway's unwired. Yeah. There might be a structural, a fear about a structural element that someone says, actually, it's healed. You're okay. They, these are found in normal people. But really? Yeah. And you were so anxious at the time that, that these are behaviors you developed and, oh, you know, the person kind of drops the fear. And once fear yeah, is gone. The education is the cure. Yeah. By just communicating that to them. Y yeah. And, but it doesn't matter how the person acquires the education. It could be simply movement for some people. Yeah. For some people, uh, breathing techniques are amazing. It just allows them to sn snap out of that sympathetic fight or flight response. For some people, it's emotional expression, journaling, talking about emotions, uh, expressing the emotion through art, or, or however people express emotion. And they each have the almost different strengths. And it's, I suppose it's finding, uh, finding what suits the person best, isn't it? You know, if they're very analytical yeah, thinking, they want some... I'm sorry, go ahead. You can say if you're analytical thinking, you want to just, it, you don't want to say, oh, here's a range of techniques, do these. For the analytical thinker, they say, yeah, but why does that, why does that help me? And what happened to me for me to experience this in the first place? So those people need to understand that. And then that, ah, right, right. Yeah. I get it. I still got to do the techniques. And overthinking things is probably a problem for recovery for some people. But at least getting to that point of understanding is important for, for some people. Yeah, I think one of the things too that was with the person that I saw was that she was able to tell at the time where my nervous system was and she never took me beyond what would do it what would start a trigger or what so she was able to really feel where my nervous system was and I'd say well, what can we do this and she go you're not ready <laughs> so she was she was unwinding my nervous system slowly and surely <clears throat> and it has been a long time for me I've been working with her, working with her and as a patient, and she does some supervisory things when I go and see some of her other patients, um, because all I do is help calm people's nervous systems down. That's all. I spend time with them, encourage them, do some meditation, maybe some shigong, teach them some skills. Um, sometimes it's like a cup of tea ministry. It's like these people are isolated. These people are, I need to not to complain all the time, but sometimes you just need to be heard. I get it. Here's some skills to help you get through it. But she never went further than my nervous system could handle. And I thought that was a really beautiful thing. And she co-regulated with me very well. Like I could tell when I went in there, if I was heightened and she could see I was anxious, I could see her breathing and calming her system down so she could come under my nervous system. It's, she sounds a very intuitive lady. She is. She, she yeah. is. A, she was amazing. She, she was very intuitive. Did you notice your excitement as you chatted about, um, not that last paragraph that we talked about, but earlier you said, oh, I feel, get myself excited. The, that, that's, that's a really important thing to control, isn't it, when you're with a patient? Because that excitement actually is a threat to some people. I have to, I have to be very, because I'm a fairly high energy person. So when I see people, I have to be able to monitor myself and get into the room and just sit for a while and calm myself down before I go and see someone because I'm more aware of where other people's energy is now. And because if they're heightened, I mean, it's like if you go to 
a doctor and you're in a really bad state and he's like, he picks up, excuse me, picks up the phone, just a minute, I'm doing this. You get this like, you get thrown. I get thrown. I'm like, he's not really getting where I'm at. And it, I find it really hard to deal with. So to go to someone who was like coming up just underneath where I was um, in anxiety, just would talk about it as an as anxious feeling yeah. instead of energy, but she could just come underneath that and I could feel it from her. I would go, oh, and that was my safety. I felt safe. And sometimes we didn't do a lot and sometimes it was just talking and but that was the, I think that was the start of my recovery. Since then, I've had a few issues um, and I have dealt with people, which is mind blowing. I will talk to some um, clients um, and they'll go, yeah, I get this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've spent five years doing this. <laughs> you just got this. How did you do that? I come home to my husband, I go, I don't really know what I'm doing in a lot of this, but they got this and I still haven't got it yet, all of it. Yeah. And some people just do. The education, it just clicks. Not yeah. very often. Yeah. How do you deal, this is interesting for me to, to listen to, how do you deal with the challenges? Let's say, I don't know, I'm telling you, Heather, it's my disc. Heather, it's, I, I understand what you're saying, Heather, that sounds really good, but my pain's real. I say all pain's real. <laughs> you're well done stay really calm there yeah I say I, I do I have to be conscious and go they're upset they're in a fear they're having a bit of a fear thing right now so take a few deep breaths and so I can understand that you're really fearful right now and try and give them hope um sometimes you can't because they're so heightened and it's like, oh, this is such a quick fix. And I've done all this before. And, you know, but you've had more experience in this than I have. Drew, how do you deal with it? Well, it's, 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 it is uh, that, that controlling your own nervous system is key. Uh, otherwise, it can go drastically wrong. Yeah. Because you, you're excited. You, you, can, you can sense the excitement when you're at the tipping point with people but um and and but you can sense when it's going wrong as well you've always got to back off if you've said something that's because uh, you're challenging deep-seated beliefs beliefs the person doesn't even know they've got yes. you're challenging behaviors the person doesn't even see that they have and so and how, shining, can the doctors, how can the doctors be wrong yeah, and they've been how can they be wrong? Reinforced by a lot more qualified people than me. Yeah, and and you're a, you're a <laughs> physiotherapist. I'm just Joe Blow. <laughs> it's like, so how would you? How what are you saying? So um, sometimes it's seed, seed planting. It might not be me that finishes the story. You know, and I might never see the end of the story. There might not be an end for that particular story, but it's about, I think you've got to be able to let go, but there's a reason that the person come into the room and if you can um, give them your best the, with the intent that you're doing everything you can to help them, but without desperation to satisfy your own needs to feel better about yourself through this process, it's mad. <laughs> because each session and, is and I think that's the, the issue with you know I have a doctor who's a great doctor a great doctor and he's he's not shy to prescribe antibiotics but he is quite alternative and he'll say to me every time how's your fibromyalgia I say well Michael we're not talking about that right because I kind of got that yeah but what do you do you need something like Michael I'm not talking about that and it's like he's got to fix this like, what aren't you sharing with me? And one of the things I think that's, you know, I've talked to different patients, like what's it like to go to different doctors? And one of the things that doctors don't realise with patients is that we, as patients, when we've seen so many people 
and we're trying to find an answer. We're not doctor shopping, we're trying to find the answer. So we've only got 10 minutes, maybe, maybe if you've got a good break, half an hour. So you're going in your head, well, I've got all these gyne things. I won't talk to them. Gyne call it, you could call them gyne in the UK. Yeah. yeah. We've got all these gyne things. That's not important. And I've got all this family stuff and that's not important. And I've got this back issue. So all I'm going to say is this, 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 and this, because that's all we can do. So we are, we are deciding what we're going to tell you. Because if we don't think it's in your realm of, um, if I'm going to a GP and he's not a gynecologist, I'm not going to tell you about any of that stuff. And that's very common with patients. They, so the doctor is like working with one hand behind his back as well. Mm. but we can't we need you to pay attention and be centered and just deal with this one thing so there's this it's bizarre it's this dance that you have to walk together with your practitioner yeah and the models of healthcare really aren't designed to support that on the whole mainstream they are not designed for that there's niche services that are amazing practitioners and amazing services, but they're not the norm for people who end up in persistent pain. We can't pain. afford. We can't afford those. I mean, we have to go to the doctors who see people for ten minutes because they're usually covered by, you know, public health. So, you know, we can't go to those expensive practitioners who will give you the time. Yeah. So it's difficult, and it must be really difficult for. Um, for doctors because they take it so personally when there's not success and as patients sometimes we fib and mm. say oh yeah I'm doing better mm. and we're not yeah it's almost uh, we we'll just be compliant again to satisfy their how are you and you know <clears throat> it's pleasing people pleasing again isn't it yeah, and it's really hard because often then you feel if you're not succeeding, you feel that the patient feels that it's their fault. Mm. Often that's happened to me. Well, you know, maybe maybe it's psychosomatic, which it actually is. But, you know, it's I often feel like I'm failing because I did all the things and it didn't work, so it had to be me. Yeah, which is which is probably the perfectionist side of you that will bring you all your success in your life, but it, it, it contributes to, our, to, the, to the experience of pain sometimes, doesn't it? By judging whether we have do something and then, has it worked? Has it worked? Has it worked? I've done it. Yeah, I should be able to fix this. <laughs> that's my, that's who I am. I sh look, I, if I just read enough books and yeah. I do enough the courses. Next, yeah, the I'm next book will be the thing. Yeah. There's a key, and as long as I keep doing this thing, and I just kept digging a bigger hole for myself because that was creating, that became one of the symptoms mm. as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The people see recovery as something to be good at again, see something to be perfect at. See yeah. So the intent behind the recovery behaviours, it isn't the behaviours, it isn't any behaviour that's, that gets you better it's the intent behind it mm. but the intent for someone who's a perfectionist is well if i do it if i if i said to someone i'll just do what you do the breathing and just twice two minutes just once a day you know, set, set the goal really small for someone to say yeah but if i do it four or five times a day will i get better quicker <laughs> and i say can if i'd have just wrote that down and showed you what you're going to say next and they go oh my god and say it's invisible, isn't it? Until someone shines a light on it, and it isn't a criticism. It's saying that those traits have brought you all your career success, all your athletic success, all your and all your illnesses. <laughs> oh, but but I said they create your pain. They create. They brought me all my certificates. I said, but now I, I have to manage my addiction to that feeling because it's addictive. Adrenaline is it's it's a magical drug, but it's it's it'll kill us. It'll kill yeah, as, as I started getting better, one thing I noticed was that I used to get the same feeling 
the same driven adren adrenaline feeling when I was in pain as when I was happy. Yeah, because it's it's the brain is substituting the behaviour. Yeah. Which is potentially overloading based on someone's past experience. So it substitutes the behaviour by triggering pain. The pain keeps the person protected from their own behaviours. And yet there are experiences, well, where's this pain from? And I haven't done anything to cause it. And it's not, but the behaviours triggering it are unconscious. And yeah, it's feeding the same dopamine loop. The stress uh, bathes the, it's called the dorsal striatum, which is an unconscious part of our brain where habits sit. So when we are stressed, dopamine flushes that part of the brain, okay? And that part of the brain is um, use the fastest mechanism we have to go towards a place of safety. And that's the behaviour of a three- and four-year-old child. The child uses that behaviour invisibly. And yet that's the behaviour that's created the stress that's flooded that part of the brain to trigger that behaviour that, and round and round they go, and it's invisible. Invisible. It's the addiction loop. So pain is, people become addicted to pain, addicted to the chemicals behind pain, and they can't even see it. But then Dan, that means that people, again, it comes back to this blame. You're saying, I'm doing this to myself. Well, not consciously. No. no, no one would ever consciously choose a life of pain. No, no one would. But there's an unconscious driver that's protecting them as an organism. It's just, just keeping them safe. It's the best thing your body can do to survive another day. And when you see it as a kind thing and um, just trying to show you that you can't continue with the same behaviours, if you haven't even seen the behaviors, you can't. It's it, people say it's my. It's an invisible disease. The doctors can't see it. Uh, no one can see it. Well, if you look from the right perspective, it's clear as day. But that 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 um, transition from being something being invisible to visible to the person is is the hardest part of this journey. And that is that is either an epiphany. It's it is a journey where we get light shone on aspects of our behavior and opportunities to change it but for some you don't know whether they'll ever be able to change it and, and that's okay too because it isn't about the observer it's person experiencing it it just feels a shame when someone defines the fact that they think i'll never overcome it never overcome it and 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 if we can if the work you do or uh, the bits and pieces I do are <clears throat> lots of others uh, that that see, see things that people sometimes can't see in themselves. If At least if we keep showing up and being available with that information, then if someone is prepared to listen or is looking for some support in that recovery, it's now available. But maybe historically, uh, maybe the last 20 years or so, anyway, it hasn't been as easy to access. It's... Um, but it's lovely thing. It's a lovely feel to be part of. I'm sure you kind of feel like um, that now. Yeah, I um, I just I love it. I'm actually doing a Deb Dana course in polyvagal. Oh so ah, yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's yeah. so fascinating. I just love it. I mean, I don't I don't deal with a lot of clients. I because initially I was like, yeah, I'll take a lot on. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so my physio was like. <laughs> No, you can't be careful. You're not getting back into the same thing again. Like, oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah you have to manage. How do it, you though. think? How do you think coronavirus is affecting our systems at the moment, or has been? We're really heightened here in Australia. Yeah, absolutely through the ceiling. Yeah. Through the ceiling. The first three months of lockdown, we, we shut uh, the clinic shut, and uh, but people would ring the clinic. Yeah, ring the clinic, and I had nothing better pain to do. Pain levels have gone up. Do you so, think? Yeah, and so up? ring the clinic with flare ups and and pain yeah. and pain. Yeah, 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 yeah. So 
I, I actually found myself because I didn't have anything else to do and I wouldn't do this all the time. But if I, if I answered the phone and someone was up, I found myself just talking them down, you know, just talking them down. But then you pick up a theme, even when we reopened the, the people are just on the ceiling. So this proportion of people, if you think of who's actually got a physical trauma related pain, that's twisted ankles or a real injury, the percentage got even less because everyone was in such a heightened state. So um, the things that take them up normally, which would be work, kids, relationship, or the dog dying and granny being poorly and having to run around a bit for her, you know, stuff that gets on top of a lot of people. Well, coronavirus, cultural fear, uh, financial insecurities, uh, lockdown, isolation, just losing the down buttons that are walking and talking and meeting and connecting and being listened to, just losing them can trigger the pathway into chronic pain. You don't have to have anything bad happen to you. You just have to have some of the good stuff taken away. And that's why I think... Yeah, that's any... interesting. It's not necessarily the bad things. It's some of the good stuff can be taken away. Yeah, you don't have to have had a traumatic childhood yeah. for some people. Yeah. You know, we're all three months away from the person in the street who's begging for money. We're all about three months away from it. If we lost all of our love, care, attention, uh, all of these things that mean more to us than any of the money we've got, if we lost them all through circumstance or situation... We're about three months away from the people that we give money to on the street and they were homeless and one thing or another. And that's what I think about chronic pain is that we, we uh, it's only a moment in time that I'm the therapist and someone's the patient. It, it, it's, it's a moment in time that you, you flipped it and you're the patient and someone else the therapist. It's, it, it, we, it connects so many people pain and if you can it, you've you've told me something I'm, I've, I've never I'm going to take away from this that's a really really lovely thing is to position yourself below the nervous system of the person you're talking to consciously position yourself below them and I think if you do that then it opens the gates that's when success happens I think yeah well something that I something that I had read today was that um, talking about co-regulation is that we can't really regulate, um, how was it? Um, co-regulation means that I feel safe with you, right? But that's the way our system has to work to calm with another person. We can't really do that by ourselves. And I think that we are living in this place of parasympathetic, very in that, looking at it, that vagus nerve system. I think we're living in that parasympathetic nervous system and we're closed down because a lot of people aren't communicating with each other deliberately because we don't feel safe. Mm. We just hear, we just don't feel that safe. We don't have enough immunization if that's what you do. Um, we, yeah, we're just not feeling safe. And so people are not, they're not communicating with each other at the moment, which is very odd because I think it's because it's gone on for so long here. We were doing well for a while and now we're not. So people are feeling very discouraged, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm picking up. But I think the physios here are saying they're just seeing more and more flare-ups. Yeah, yeah. Oh, completely so before i before i let you go heather yeah what are your, your what are your what, what are your bits top 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 three tips what your advice be to someone who's starting this journey somebody who's coming across what you say for the first time um what would you say to them if you were thinking what were the three lines of encouragement you could give them be kind to yourself. Um, don't set a time for your healing because that puts a lot of pressure on you because I was very good at setting time. <laughs> My pain <laughs> had to get healed by a certain time. Trust me. Um, be kind to yourself. A lot of forgiveness, a lot of calming, just doing things that, 
baths, you know, going for walks, um, all the things that calm the nervous systems down, being in nature, some meditation, um, finding a good practitioner that can walk alongside you on the journey because it really is a journey of the heart, I think. It is of pain, but it's also a journey of the heart. That's kind of how I feel about it. And because it's just, it's emotional for me how much I have gained out of this. Um, there's been a lot of pain, but there's been a lot of opening as well. So, and the kind of people that you meet on the way, like my physio, Shelley Barlow, yourself, you know, um, the Howard Schubiners of the world, the Alan Gordons, the these people with sense of humours and gentleness. And anyway, you asked me three things and I didn't, I didn't stop it. Sorry. Well, it's a heartfelt answer, though. It's just, it, it, it's... Um... It's very honest, though, and, and um, that experience of uh, sharing that journey with people, people you don't even know, might never even meet, though, there's, there's, a, there's a sense of connectedness when you know you're part of a, a community. You don't have to be in Facebook groups, be you? but, you know, just to know that other people are experiencing similar things and yeah. there are different points in our recoveries. I don't have any pain now where I'm very blessed, I don't, and uh, you have some but much less than you ever did and you're much better equipped to um deal with any more that you might experience and any stresses and strains that come before the experience of pain you're much better equipped to deal with them and through that experience you can share with other people can't you and and that sharing of that it does it does give you something back but rather Absolutely. than Absolutely. rather than being dependent part of the healing too yeah, that's part of your own healing. But, you, but we don't have to be de dependent on sharing it for it for us to feel better, for you to feel better. It's just we, you you have the skills to do it. Should should somebody else want to kind of share their experience with yours? So it's been lovely listening to you, Heather. Yeah, um, lovely to talk to you too, Drew. Thank you for your time. The um the 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 lady, your physio. What's what's she called? Shelly. Shelley, no, no I've, I've never met her, but uh, would you pass? No, her, would you pass her well, Mary I, She works at a public hospital, and people, have, my clients, have said, "Why doesn't she go in public practice? Like she could make a fortune." And her answer is, "I work in the public health system because they're the people who need me the most." Oh, well, tell her uh, uh, I'm inspired by you, and I'm inspired by you, and thank you for giving me something from this interview that uh, I'll use in my practice. Well, I've got a lot from you, from your little things that you put on. They've been really helpful. And I'm excited to read your book. Oh, well, I hope you enjoy it. And I, yeah, thank I, you, Drew. And the situations we're both in with the lockdown and we're a little bit further ahead of you at the moment, but who knows what happens in the UK. I, I wish you the best with uh, uh, that can come out of it. It, it. it will come to an end eventually, won't it? Yeah. Yeah, it was lovely to chat to you. Thanks, Drew. I'll I'll um this will I'll pop this in the group. There's, there's uh, I think it'll probably be in the October month if that's okay. And, yeah, I'll, and give you you head, I'll give you a heads up. Edit anything out? You think it's a bit like <laughs> a bit foo foo? Yeah, like I'm fine. I'm fine with that. <laughs> it's, it's lock, stock, and barrel. It's really authentic. It's lovely. So I um uh, I'll I'll post it. I'll post it next month. Can I just ask you a quick question? Yeah. Of course. Um, said that you had done you do training i thought on the one of the uh, the the one with uh, tms journey tms roundtable you said that you do courses you lead courses in pain to uh, yeah there's a there's a one there is a, there's a technique called old pain to go that was yeah. probably my entry point into this i described on that chat because <clears throat> it's quite a strange or it appeared strange to me it's it's quite a uh, it's potentially a very quick way to switch off pain, chronic pain. So quick, it, it, it's mind blowing, and um, but it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, 
Yeah. So I did this about four years ago, and, and as I can train physios, I train people in, in that process. There's other people who can train. You can just Google all pain to go, and you'll find a website, and there's a gentleman called Stephen Blake, and there's people who can train people on there, and I was <clears throat> one of those. So I don't do that often now, um, but I use it in practice sometimes, or I'll just... Yeah, it, it, it basically gives people... There's a quick fix for some subsection of people. Mm -hmm. There's a, a long fix, but the bottom line is that there's, a, there's a fix for people. So it's positioned for some people, um, and I don't quite know why it works with this subset. We were doing some research on it with the university. So uh, it's fascinating to watch, but if you went on that website, um, it, it tells you a little bit more about it. It's not my technique. It's just something I came across. Yeah, it's so from, I had a little bit of a research, yeah. Yeah, it's from that that, that that kind of piqued my interest as to how can it work. And it, and when you would, when you would um, talk to someone who's had pain for 10 years, 15 years or whatever, it's not that complicated an explanation at all. And within 20 minutes, it, the pain's gone. Now, sometimes it would come back, but sometimes it's gone and never come back. And, and that's mm. really fascinating to observe and to use. So, yeah, it's got all paid to go. So I'm kind of a, a trainer in that. Just to talk to I guess you're trying to concentrate on your book and your practice. So you're not going to be doing any training? Well, I just, I, 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 it's, I suppose now I did some, before again, before lockdown, we did. Um, I saw that actually. I yeah. did. I did some courses, but um, and then during lockdown, I did an on online uh, with a group of people. So you know, the training is only a day or so. Uh, so it's something I consider if someone's keen to learn it, or but there's other people can uh, give their perspective on it. But she, it was just well, something Shelley that... actually asked. I had been telling her about you, and Shelley actually asked if you were doing any training, and she'd like to be involved. So. All oh, right, yeah. Well, if you, you're welcome to pass on a name or contact details or anything like that, and then I'm quite flexible about how do, how do you and talk. I, I would like to do it too, so. Oh, if, you, if, you, if you were interested in that old pen to go, once you, if you looked at the background of it and you wanted me to, to do some training, do the training, I'm sure we'd be able to set something up. Okay, I'll we'll let her know set that. something up. And uh, with the technology nowadays, so that, you know, I'm happy to be open to that possibility. Um, I'm quite flexible with what I do with my practice because it's, you know, it's all fun, isn't it? It's all good. Patience, yeah. Zoom, and I online. Think what's, great, what's great now too is that um, like pain revolution, um, they're using people like myself who are not professionals, but people who've had a lived experience of pain in their reference groups and, you know, talking to their local pain educators and, you know, so that's what I've been actually doing a lot fair bit of actually talking and helping some of the practitioners understand what it's like to be from a you know a lived experience of pain which has been I think that's a great thing so yeah, he's involving yeah. a lot of people doing that now yeah we've copied it in the UK it started in the UK it's oh okay called uh what's it called flipping pain okay and it's Dr. Carl Mac Ryan, and they just Lauren Mosley's on the consulting panel for that group, and so they're doing the same thing. Started in Lincolnshire and doing some bike rides and community groups, and got bottom up essentially, and involving people at all levels, which is which is lovely. Yeah. So yeah, it's nice to be part of that, isn't it for you? So. Yeah, I'm just a part of a reference group with three other professionals, and just have a look at the you know their work and say how does a lay person understand this mm. uh, that's been good for me it's been great well All right. for this morning or this evening and we'll yeah. stay in touch we'll keep in touch heather and will do, Drew. thanks for sharing your story okay thank you nice to meet you All right, bye nice